Welcome to RSA Conference 2023. We're recording live from Broadcast Alley here in Moscone West. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with Carl Treves, uh, SVP of Product Management and the GM of Application Security at Imperva. Welcome, sure. Carl. Bye. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Uh, we love having you here because a topic I wanted to talk with you about, I think you wanted to talk about as well, is business logic. Now, business logic is one of those things that everybody just says, take care of business logic. And it's two words, and that's about it. I think we need a better definition at least, or what does business logic look like? Yeah, you know, uh, it, you know, when developers build applications, that's what they're focusing on is the business logic, the code that, that runs the business or runs that application. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to like, um, like attacking something like with a signature, like, like a SQL injection or other type of thing, um, the business logic attacks um, tend to be very focused on the specific weaknesses of the logic of the application. Uh, and so in order to do that though, you know, typically attackers have to go in and try to surveil and actually understand the application, map yeah. it out, understand how data is traversing the app, how are users accessing, what does the authentication look like, are there open areas, what is the schema, and all these things, and then based on that, they're able to take action based on that. So, so when we talk about business logic, that's what we're referring to, is kind of all those pieces that come together from the developer, and that, that's become that very fertile ground now for attackers to go in and mine, Absolutely. because you really get the keys to the kingdom once you're in there. And right? I think it's always been a fertile ground, hasn't it? Because even, as, as you mentioned, like a SQL injection, there are linters, there's ways to detect that in code. We have known patterns that this should have been prepared statement, et cetera. Absolutely. Business logic, that is workflows. That's the state machine that honestly takes some human thinking to, to, to as you were saying, to surveil, but as, well as, but as well as to like, is this secure? How, how, is, how is someone going to take this apart? That's what humans are there for. Absolutely, yeah, and that, that's the big challenge too because um, developers typically are constantly changing the application. Right. Um, and then it's complicated because it's not like just one person typically mm -hmm. working on something. It could be tens, hundreds, thousands, you know. Um, you could be pulling in all sorts of different open source, connecting it in different ways. And you can build these very rich applications. However, developers tend not to be very good at security, right? They think through, okay, here's they're there to make the application work. And I know because I'm a developer by trade. And my focus always was let's build it, let's make it fast, let's make it work and get it out. What you don't think about is necessarily is what are all the things I need to do within these very stateful big applications to ensure that they're secure. And you know, if you look at, you know, just go through all the CVEs that come out on any daily basis, you can see how many applications have these, you know, all these vulnerabilities. You know, a good one is like Log4j, for example. That's a, that's a great example of something that really got rooted out of the business logic of the application, if you ask me. And there's many others out there. So, so they're not going away. It's just you need to come up with a strategy on how to defend and mitigate the impact of attacks against the business logic and the applications you use. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the, or the, the attacks that are targeting the application, because from a developer's perspective, as you said, it, it, honestly, those state mechanisms, those workflows also get complex. One person really can't keep that all in their head, right. and so attackers come and find some of those surprising ways, perhaps, that, oh, I didn't think this was going to be abused in this manner. I exactly, and APIs are a fertile ground for that. And the reason they're so fertile is that as opposed to like your traditional web apps, mm -hmm. traditional web apps pretty much control your access to the application or at least manage it pretty well. You know, you check boxes, mm -hmm. you have form fields and things like that, and then it translates and you go to your back app and a lot of times you'll have protections and other mechanisms there that kind of mitigate anything there. Well, the APIs bypass typically all of that. Many times they're accessing databases directly, mm -hmm. you know, and so they don't have the same mitigations. And also, you know, these APIs are also trying to do things differently than the web app. You know, they're trying to provide access to a lot of different types of data. Um, it's not just things that, you know, a curated experience using a web form. And so as such, you know, having these very complex changing APIs in the environment, it's much easier for attackers to go in and, you know, find the vulnerabilities, first of all, in the APIs themselves. Mm -hmm. So figure out how they can mimic a valid user and then start to access these different backends and aspects of these things and see, oh, okay, now I understand the schema. Well, wait a second, this object here 
you know, ah, I have access to an object that I, nor I shouldn't have access to, right? Like, you know, like yeah. a Bola exploit or some function or something like that. Once they get in there, they can get deeper and then eventually they can root around to other systems as well, right? Because also once you're at that layer of typically in your application, you wind up being able to find other ways around in the infrastructure. Go find some more data. Yeah, so, exactly. it's a, so it's a really enticing place to go mine and that's why you're, we see like, um, last year you know, alone, um, we saw about 17% of attacks against APIs were business logic attacks. And, and on top of that, another 22% were some sort of automated attack as well. And that's just growing. We see that growing every day. And so it's just becoming that rich area for attackers to go in and mine and get value and you know be destructive. You know, to me, I like I, honestly. I also like the business logic because that's where creative thinking goes too. Absolutely. And you were describing about the APIs. There are mobile apps. They'll be backed by APIs, but often attackers can go in and poorly design what mobile apps. They'll grab the secrets out of that. So they have the API key. So now. You've got, is this API, is this a mobile app talking to it? Or is this the botnet that just so happens the API key or the hacker with the API key interacting with it? And how do you distinguish that? Is I think it becomes one of those questions that surprise developers, isn't it? You know, it's a really good question because what one of the things we saw last year, and we have a bad bot report that we're publishing mm. here. We do it every year, it's coming out in another week or two. But one of the things we've seen is that um, the mobile, basically the mobile browser emulation um, the okay. attacks from that are growing quickly because in part, you look at like Apple and others, they put all this obfuscation technology mm -hmm. in, right? For, you know, basically to protect privacy, which protect is the, great, yeah. but it also protects the hackers, right? And so it's much harder to then look at behaviors or other aspects of what you're doing to kind of root out these headless browsers and mm -hmm. these headless mobile browsers for, or, or uh, mobile agents, that's mm -hmm. another big area, you know, versus, um, you know, um, you know, being able to, to detect humans, you know. So, so that's one of the big areas of like uh, of bot detection is how do I validate who the person is in, in, as things become more, you know, increasingly more difficult to detect. And mobile is one of the big areas. In fact, I think 60% of all application access now is over mobile devices. So as a percentage now, it's much larger than just your ordinary browsers, if you look at it. Yeah, I think if we look at browsers, they're basically the new operating system, same with mobile apps. That's in the sense of nobody needs root anymore, they just need access to Mike's valid credentials or Mike's browsing session or mobile session to get his data, for example. Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. No, I, I think that's a great way to say it. It's, it's, it's become kind of the operating system of the internet, basically. You know? um, in fact, the, you know, the, one of the ways I look at a web application firewall, mm -hmm. I, I think of it as a platform because basically everything's being transacted over HTTP or GraphQL or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Um, and it provides that platform for managing those protocols. But then on top of that, you start to layer then more specific aspects of the application and business, the business logic components yes. of that always reside on that. And so in the past, it always says, oh, it's a TCP stack. No, it's really the web stack and then it's the application stack that sits on top of that. Well, when we start to talk to developers, uh, I want to avoid being able to say, like, just write secure code. Mm -hmm. Don't have business knowledge mistakes. Those are nice to say, but um, I don't think that's actually helpful. <laughs> so how do we give, like, developers the idea of what, you've given some ideas of what business logic attacks are, yeah. what they might look like. What are some of the ways to either expand on that or to help developers protect their applications from these types of attacks? Yeah, I mean, there's the obvious things you need to do with an application, you know, when you're building it. And that is, you know, the simple, I need to test it, I need to validate it. And, you know, one of the things I always advise is that you build your tests before you actually write the code for the uh -huh. application, you know, so you do test-driven development. Mm -hmm. And that, those are just good hygienic principles. But then it starts to boil down to, well, how do I manage like 100 developers all aggregating and testing, you know, putting their code together and doing that? And there's mechanisms like A-B testing and things like that, but sure. that still doesn't get at the heart of the issue. And so then you got to start bringing in things more around conformance and validation oh, and that. Okay. And that's actually, so when you look at API security, there's really two major areas that we see our customers mm -hmm. addressing. One is kind of the compliance side, and I'll explain that in a moment. And then of course there's just the, the straight up security side, gotcha. you know, protecting things. On the compliance side, what they're asking for is not just, hey, we have this open banking initiative, we need to protect APIs for that. They're saying, you know what, I want you to detect when there's changes in the APIs and then if those are not valid per policy, I want you to block those. Oh, uh, interesting. And then what I would like you to do is as you're discovering the APIs, the schemas, the endpoints, mm -hmm. the data, I want you to build essentially a test platform that my developers can use, run against that, validate that, and if it doesn't conform to that, then they can change their code. And that's what we're seeing out there. And so 
So, so there's that dev-centric side, mm -hmm. and then there's kind of the, I'm going to protect it side, if you will. Yeah, and I think that is, I always get nervous saying that we're going to block this, we're going to turn off your access, because that feels like a, a tough negotiation to have with the developers, a, a source of friction perhaps between that AppSec side and DevOps teams. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, you don't want to block the progress. You know, basically, the, you don't want to stop the business, right? right? At the end of the day, they're there because they're writing code that supports your business goals. And so you don't want to stop that. In fact, it was kind of like what happened early days of the web application firewall mm -hmm. market, where companies started, to, you know, in fact, back in, back in the day, our release product did just positive security logic. And great, blocks everything. The problem is as soon as you change the app, it blocks that. Yeah. And that was not acceptable. And so we had to develop mechanisms that allowed that tuning. You know? And so it's the same thing with APIs today, mm -hmm. is that yes, you could put an absolute block, you add a new field, you add, do anything, boom, we're going to block it. That, that's not going to fly. So what you want to do is, instead of surprising developers, you need to be able to insert into their workflows with low or no friction such that they can validate, do this, run through their automation, and then build the app, and then know that they've done everything they can to ensure it's, you know, it's the highest integrity possible. That makes that, sense. That's what yeah. you want. It's, uh, what I've learned is if you get in the way of developers, they will find a way around, and then that'll create a hole, and then that'll be a problem. And so this, right. it, it has to be seamless, is, yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah. No, and that makes sense. And I think that speaks to the idea of, you mentioned like GraphQL, for example, or just detecting what's changing in API. Mm -hmm. And GraphQL, we're not going to see the, the SQL injection style right. attacks against that. But we wouldn't want an API change so that it's suddenly a, a query can return everybody's information rather than just the, the, the current user's information. That, those are subtle changes, but those can have drastic effects. No, and you're absolutely right, is that um, it's, it, it's any time there's a change in that underlying technology there, mm -hmm. then you create opportunities because the developers aren't necessarily used to that, and then they open up, based on that ignorance of how it works, it creates those opportunities for those types of flaws. And that's the, those, that's the problem. That's, that's the thing that's hard to stop. And it's an yeah. iterative kind of best practices oriented thing, you know, like we were just talking about. That you go after that, but you're absolutely right. And there'll be new ones. There's other ones that are coming along. There you will know. be new ones. There's always new. Oh, AI, AI is going to create all sorts of new fun things, <laughs> isn't it? You know, so. Well, so speaking of, so you have a bad bots report. You've been doing this for a couple of years. Yeah. Was there something that was either a, a surprising bot on you this year, or, or maybe if there wasn't, is there something that uh, is coming up in the next few years that you suspect is going to appear as a bot on those reports? Yeah, no, the, you know, nothing surprising this okay. year. Just growth, and it, you know, we look at like bad bot growth. Now, about 30% of the traffic on the internet's bad bots. That's what it comes down to. And, um, you know, we're seeing things that we expected, like the rise of those attacks against the business logic. Mm -hmm. API exploits have gone up massively. Um, just because it's like such rich ground. But, um, and, and then the other thing we see is that evasive bots, uh, and these are bots that you know, are trying to emulate human behaviors, you uh, know, with yes, mouse okay. moves, and they're evasive, yes. and they're, they're rotating their IP Going addresses, the, yeah, and they're coming from different regions. Behavior type of attacks. Exactly, yeah. and so it's, and, and you know, an average attack will have like 200,000 IP addresses, you know what I mean, from these different, you know, and so they're coming from all over, and so each one is kind of trying to do their own thing and try to piece, you know, piecing it together. Mm -hmm. Um, and I expect the sophistication of those to go up significantly because, as we were talking about earlier, um, the, the, the bot, you know, the, the, the code that's driving these bots today is, is sophisticated, mm -hmm. but it's not reentrant or learning. It doesn't learn uh, necessarily, you know, um, at least on a very limited basis it can. Right. Now, just imagine you start to turn loose a generative AI system that has the ability to learn in ways that it's difficult for humans and piece things together mm -hmm. very quickly um, and then, then go back and retest, you know, basically resurveil and keep putting yes. that picture together and doing it very quickly. And so that's the challenge for, is the challenge is that since they can do it very quickly, you have to then start to develop mechanisms that can piece that together and proactively block it. Quicker. Respond just the and same. Yeah, exactly. and so I just expect that to now kind of exponentially become more difficult. Ch CAPTCHAs, I think CAPTCHAs, I've said this before, <sighs> I think CAPTCHAs are dead. I think, you know, a year from now, CAPTCHAs are going to be crossed. a useless thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, I know, don't get <laughs> yes. it. They were, they were the worst thing ever to begin with, and now. <laughs> Even the know. humans don't like them. The, the, yeah, the machines are going to realize soon enough that they hate them too, but yeah. if they can solve that so we get get rid of CAPTCHAs, 
it sounds like a good success. Story. Yeah, well, yeah, it just it just means you're gonna have, we have to have other mechanisms, and so maybe waiting rooms or other things you just yes, have to indeed. do. Yes, well, indeed. Uh, well, Carl, we don't have any other mechanisms to check with you're a human or a bot, but I think these you haven't been evasive on any of these questions, so I think you're pretty solidly human. Thank you for all these. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, thanks for having me here today. This is great. Wonderful. Thanks again, Carl. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about Imperva, their work on bad bot reports, uh, check out securityweekly.com/slash. Imperva RSAC. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks.